Yes. All right. We're five by five. Hi, everybody. My name is Daryl Moore, and we're so glad you're here. Uh, this is the first go-to meeting of your first day of class, and you guys are all the, uh, the eager folks, the ones who show up on day one. And uh, we want to welcome you to Full Sail. We're so happy that you're here, and we want to uh, get everybody acclimated and have everyone have a very successful time uh, studying online in FSO. So uh, these global sessions, you'll, you'll notice that you have lots of people who aren't in your regular class. There are several sections of digital literacy being taught at the same time. So we have five or six of these global sessions. Each one is taught by a different teacher. It may not be your actual teacher. Uh, and we all go through the same material. These are like keynotes. These are setting you up for the week. Each week has a theme and all the activities build on each other. And so everyone has to go to one of these globals. And you just pick the one that's most convenient to you. You don't have to pick the one that your teacher is teaching and your teacher may not actually teach one. But then the other ones are the labs. And those are the things that are smaller classes with just your teacher. So I want to just explain that. And uh, that's what we're going to do tonight. I'm just going to get everybody on board. Um, you're brand new sailors, and we're so happy that you're here, and we want to just get everybody um, rolling. Uh, I think you all know that you're going to graduate sooner than your, other, your, your peers at other schools, and the way that happens is these classes move fast. So this is an on-ramp. We're going to get you up to speed. I'm going to start off at 5 miles an hour. By the time this hour is done, I'm going to be at 15 miles an hour. And by the time you guys finish the first month of Full Sail, you'll be cruising along at your average 75 miles per hour pace that you're going to keep up for 30 months straight, and then you'll be graduated. So that's the Full Sail way, and um, that's what I want to help everybody get uh, acclimated to. So today, we're going to talk about this um, GoToMeeting software. You guys are all here, so obviously it's working. You just clicked on a link, you registered, you clicked on a link, you got, and something automatically got uh, installed on your computer, and you just followed along, and now you're here. Well, this, is, this software is made by Citrix. It's called uh, GoToMeeting, and we're using a form of it called GoToTraining. It allows us to do a couple of things. We could do webcasts, but that uses off an enormous amount of bandwidth. We're probably going to have over 100 people in here tonight, so... We have to conserve our bandwidth. So what we're doing is we show off the desktop. I'm going to show some slides, and I'm going to open up a browser and talk you through some things, and you'll hear my voice. And so that's the way these global sessions go. Now, in the smaller sessions where we have more bandwidth, we can open up the webcams. It's really not important. It's much more important to just show you content because that's what we're focusing on. But GoToMeeting is, is a, a pretty robust software. It usually works. It, uh, but like all software, it often doesn't. And so I want to help you uh, know how to deal with it instead of freaking out or anything like that. So one thing that's going to happen if you have a, a bandwidth issue, see this is all, you know, there are a hundred of us all over the world connected at the same time. It's really a miracle that this stuff works at all. So occasionally something's going to happen. And what will probably happen is if you are on a kind of a sketchy, Wi-Fi connection, something that might come and go, the audio might hang. So the way to fix the audio, if you're getting everything else, is um, there's a control panel that got installed with several different windows. They all have blue tabs on them, and they have names. And there's one with the name audio. And if you're connected with your computer, and you're listening on the speakers of your computer, and you're going to talk with the microphone of your computer, then it should be set on mic and speakers. Some of you have called into a free 800 number and, or, use, or you use the iPhone app and you call into a telephone number. So you toggle this back and forth to say how you're listening to audio. However, if you lose audio, you can use this to, to kind of do a reset. So if you're on the telephone and you lose audio, switch over and switch back. If you're on the computer and you use audio, switch to telephone and switch back. That does a kind of soft reset of just the audio and maybe that'll work. Uh, and if the whole thing freezes on you, you can leave the room and come back with the uh, link that was in your email. And that's kind of like a reset of the software. So, uh, you know, it, 
it'll happen occasionally. It's going to happen to me. Uh, if you're a digital person, you know that computers can't be relied on 100% of the time. So that's why we're always prepared. And that's part of what we're going to talk about this month, just making sure that you uh, don't get yourself in a bind because you're depending on things that you know can't work perfectly. Um, and it, is everyone hearing my audio now? I'm hearing that people can't hear. Someone type if you can hear. Okay, so most of you can hear. Some of you can't. If you can't, I just explained how to reset, but you probably couldn't hear me. That's just the way things go. Uh, so what are some of the other features here? Well, you all have a microphone, and you, this is an open room. We want to have, it, have everyone talk, but it's just like a classroom with 100 people in it. Uh, not everybody talks at once. So uh, I have shut off everyone's microphone. I have control of that, and I can turn anyone's microphone on. I can turn them on globally or one at a time. And uh, we start the room with everything muted, and to, to let you know why, I'm going to turn on everyone's microphone and want everyone to say hello to everyone else. Why? I'm going to turn on everyone. Everybody say hello. 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 Okay. Now you know why we mute the audio. And so how do we uh, have an interactive exchange? Well, in a classroom, you raise your hand. And on this software, there's this little uh, icon on the side of the, the, the toolbar. It's a little hand with a green arrow pointing up and a red hand pointing down. And that's like raising your hand. I can see that. And I see a couple of people with hands raised already. I'm going to call on Kimberly Hall. Kimberly, are you there? I'm unmuting your microphone. Want to say hello? Yeah. Hi, Kimberly. Hi. Where are you from? Montgomery. Montgomery. What are you, Steve? What are you studying? Audio production. Audio production. Well, we're really glad you're here. Uh, thanks for coming. All right. All right. Let's hear from Donnie Eller. Donnie, are you there? Hey, I'm from North Carolina, and I'm studying game art. Hey, Donnie. Say hello to everybody. Hello. All right. So, Donnie said hello. Now let's all go to the chat box and say hello back to Donnie. I want everyone to go down to the bottom and type, hello, Donnie, in the chat box. Let's all make him feel really welcome. There you go. Now you can see the chat box moves very fast when we have 100 people in it. And that's, there's nothing we can do about that. That's just kind of the live hubbub. But the chat box is another way that we can all have feedback. I can ask questions. Anybody can ask questions. I'm here by myself, so if, if somebody asks a question and it rolls by and I don't see it, I apologize. But um, uh, everybody was engaging and saying where they were from earlier. Let's all do that again. Everybody type where you're coming from, and we'll just see it fly by in a hurry. Chicago, Virginia, Chicago City, Austin, Charlotte. Oh, I can't even read them all, but looks like the, the country's represented pretty well. We also have a lot of international students, uh, and we have uh, military folks from all over the world. But, um, you know, it looks like we have this, the entire country represented pretty well here. So we're going to use the chat. We're going to have we're going to allow people to talk. Um, if you want to, if you raise your hand, in, uh, the, it's a toggle. So you can click it again to lower your hand. I can lower all the hands again so we can have people raise them again. And so we will talk that way. Um, so <clears throat> we'll use these features. And I'm also recording this presentation so people who can't make it we realize that not everybody is going to be able to attend uh, it exactly every uh, time this is more important for your labs than than with the globals because with the globals if you miss tonight you could always just go to one tomorrow but um, the the, uh, the sessions get recorded so if you're not able to attend live you can watch a recording um, so uh, I want to mention a couple of things. One is uh, to talk about uh, staying in contact. You were all issued a, uh, a full sale email account. And I know it's brand new, so you're not used to it. But we want you to get into the habit of checking it regularly. Now, it's not as important so much for FSO because we have messaging on the system now. But we didn't always have messaging. Email was crucial then. Uh, now, the rest of the school uses email. So um, 
full, uh, your email account is how you're going to hear from financial aid. It's how you're going to hear from advising. Uh, if, if you get ebooks or software codes for uh, classes and things, all that stuff's going to come in your email. So it's good to get into the habit of checking your email regularly. And you can send your teacher email all the time. Your teacher is constantly checking email as well. But because brand new students don't necessarily have an email habit yet, we replace the uh, regular communication within the FSO system with a messaging system. So it, it works a lot like, say, Facebook or something like that, where on the actual platform, you can just click on the little mail icon. You can write a message directly to your teacher. And this is improved communication uh, 100%. So it's important to kind of know the difference and, and treat them slightly separately. Email is a little bit more formal. So when you start to write emails, you want to address the message to someone. You want to say who's writing because, you know, it's like a letter. You want to sign it at the end. Uh, email has a subject line, so you want to fill that in as well. So uh, email isn't really tif difficult or anything, but you want to follow those conventions. And when you're messaging your teacher from the FSO platform, it's not quite so important because you can message from the top bar. There's a little button up here where you can just send a message. But when you're in each individual assignment, you can also message at the bottom. There's a comment section. And um, if you're on an assignment at the bottom, you can write a comment and that will go directly to your teacher. And that communication is only between you and your teacher. So in those cases, you don't really have to put your name. You don't really have to say what you're talking about because it's in context. But, you know, in the old days, we used to just get um, an email that didn't have a name on it and didn't have a subject line and just said, I don't understand. And we didn't really know how to help people. Nowadays, if you're on uh, the, the 1.5 assignment page and you say, I don't understand this, we will know what you're talking about. So uh, messaging has really improved communication and really um, we endeavor to get back to everyone very quickly. Full Sail has a policy for all teachers that we will respond to every single thing that we receive within 24 hours, uh, and that holds for email and messaging. But really, pretty much for messaging, you'll find us online all day and responding usually within 20 or 30 minutes of you having sent a message. So it really helps to stay in contact with your teacher. And there are other ways you can call. We have phone numbers that are available. We have instant message channels uh, that, that are published and so forth. So communication is highly important. And, um, you know, for an online system, for you as a student to feel connected, not just to your students, uh, to your fellow classmates, but to your teacher, you want to keep checking all those communication channels. So uh, let's talk about digital literacy. None of you are going to, class, uh, to school to major in digital literacy. Uh, no matter what you're studying, whether you're studying audio production or video production or video game design, Everybody starts full sale taking digital literacy. So why do we think it's important that everyone have uh, an understanding of digital literacy? Now, you, are, you all already know that I love to talk. So I could just you know, lecture you for 20 or 30 minutes about the importance of digital literacy. But that's not a conversation. That's a, that's a monologue. Let's have a conversation. Let's see some people raise their hands. And let's hear from you guys what you think digital literacy is and why it's important. So I want to call on Jason Goodis. Jason, are you there? And did I mangle your name? Jason, can you hear me? Well, we're going to try somebody else. Um, Jeanette Johnson. Jeanette, are you there? Yes. Hi, Jeanette. Hi. What do you think digital literacy is yes, all about? Yes, I'm here. Hello, how are you? I'm good. How about you? I think it's about um, showing us how to, I'm great. I think it's about showing us how to um, be more effective and with our online resources, our technology to get our schoolwork done and whatnot. How to use resources, how to be more effective. That's a great answer. Thanks. Yeah. Let's hear from somebody else. Um, Angel Toro. That's a classic name. Hi, Angel. Are you there? Yes, I'm here. Hi, Angel. Hello. What do you think digital literacy is? Hi. 
Um, digital literacy is uh, understanding of the World Wide Web and all of its applications and the different types of user platforms and social medias and uh, reference resources and all the different ways to navigate through all the systems uh, to make it make sense kind of as one and um, it's it's its own language it's just like how we speak language um, you know speak digital software applications all right so the internet navigating the internet knowing of all its secrets learning software excellent answer thank you Angela thank you um, Melissa Zercher. Melissa, are you there? Um, I think digital literacy is important, kind of to touch on what Angel said, uh, because it's kind of like speaking a different language entirely. I mean, the way people operate on online is very different from uh, just sitting with a textbook in your lap and being able to just highlight and take notes. So, I mean, it's a completely different feat. Absolutely. You know, you're going to find that what we tend to do here a lot is we stick the word digital in front in front of something else and think that it means something. I mean, uh, I mean, we, we have a purpose to what we're doing here. But if you just took the, the, the digital away and said literacy, you know, obviously you'd think of language. But literacy is a little bit more than just language, isn't it? Melissa, do you? Uh, yeah. Oh, no, yeah, no, I agree. Literacy. Do you speak and read Russian? I speak and read Arabic. Okay. Well, you're 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 uh, very advanced then, but you don't you don't really read Russian, do you? No, no. If I were to suddenly pick you up and drop you in a Russian airport, and you really, really, really had to go to the bathroom, I'll bet you could find the bathroom, even though you couldn't read the Cyrillic signs. Yeah, there'd be a symbol. There's symbols. So. There's color. There's there's uh, signage. You know, there's the international man woman signs. Uh, you mm -hmm. would know by the shape of the signs. So literacy is beyond just language. It's all this glue that holds things together. And when we talk about digital literacy, there's just this um, glue that's everywhere that it's almost hard to talk about. I mean, uh, everyone tries to add things to their, their text characters to present emotion. You know, the LOLs and, the, and the smiley faces are, are kind of cliches by now, but, you know, people sometimes... Uh, just chat in emoji alone. So uh, we are trying to stretch the boundaries of language on the internet to uh, make up for the lack of human face-to-face -face contact, which gives us all kinds of extra information that we all know how to read. We Nobody ever taught us how to read someone's face to know when they're happy or sad, but we learn those things. And on the internet, there's a lot of little subtle things like that that become important. And uh, I think you're very cued into that. Thanks, Melissa. All right. Let's hear from one more person. Uh, Michael Jinright. Are you there? Hi, how you doing? Good. How about you? I'm doing pretty good. So what's digital literacy to you? Uh, to me, digital literacy is the ability to utilize all that technology has to offer for us in this day and age and being able to keep up with the technological advances that we're making every day, every year, and finding ways to use it in a format that can promote healthy learning for uh, the younger generation as they're coming up with more laptops and more iPads and everything in the classrooms and stuff. And also being able to teach the generation that came you know, before it on how to use it. That's a great answer. So with new technology, it never stops, does it? I mean, you can't learn this stuff once and then let, uh, coast for 30 years. Every year, yeah, it never stops. There's new stuff that you got to learn. So it's yes. learning how to be in a kind of lifelong learning mode, and that's part of what the digital age is all about. Everybody keeps reinventing things. Yes. All right. Thank you, Michael. All of these were great answers, and they all combine to what we're talking about. So. Uh, everything everyone said is part of this, and uh, it, it makes it worth spending some time before you go on to your other fields of stubborn endeavor to become um, attuned to what it means to be an online student. It's about knowing and learning software, specific bits of software, 
And also, uh, we're going to show you a lot of uh, web applications that live in, in web pages. So we're going to introduce you to software because um, <clears throat> you all aren't getting your laptop for another couple of week, uh, months. Uh, now's the time in chat where everyone can go boo hiss because you're not getting your laptop today or yesterday. But for uh, at least a couple of months, you're going to have to go along on whatever you have. And uh, it's not fair for us to say, well, you have to have Microsoft Office on, your, on, on the laptop that we haven't given you yet. So we are going to show you things online that you all can use for free uh, so that we all have a common base of software that we're using. And again, it is about becoming Internet savvy. We don't want anybody sending their money off to Nigerian princes or getting uh, catfished or anything like that. So we're going to learn what it means to be... Um, uh, critical and um, and uh, alert and secure on the internet. Uh, we're going to talk a lot about conducting proper research. We're going to show you the school library, which is incredibly cool. It's not like any library you've ever seen or, or experienced before. It's very much a you know 21st century uh, rock and roll online library. But Everyone needs to know how to do proper research. We know that you use Google for everything, but we're going to make you a better Googler. Uh, we don't want everyone taking the first hit after they they uh, send their magic request to Google. We want you to learn how that algorithm works. We want you to be able to give it proper requests to get what you want. We want you to learn how to vet the material that it throws back at you so you can have that radar built in between, oh, this is something I can trust and, oh, this is something that kind of smells. I'm going to put it off in the corner and, and not use it. So we want to make you better Googlers. We're going to talk about communication practices. We're going to learn uh, the different levels of formality of, of different types of communicating online so that um, you don't send uh, a highly informal or uh, uh, disrespectful email to someone who might be an employer. Or, uh, you know, you'll always know what the proper channel to communicate your uh, request is. And lastly, it's about creating a professional online presence. Uh, this may sound odd on your first day of school, but today is the day you've begun looking for a job. Now, you're not going to knock on the door today and, 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 or fill out an application, and 30 months from now, uh, you're probably not even going to fill out an application. You're not even going to hand someone a resume. The days when you could make up a resume and lie like a, a rug and put all kinds of stuff on there and fool people are over. If you want a job today, uh, most likely they're going to Google you. And when they do Google you, what are they going to find? If you don't like the answer that you're telling yourself right now, then the next 30 months are a chance to start building your digital footprint in a way that makes you the person someone will want to hire when they Google you. Uh, it's about building your presence as an authority. Uh, are you the troll on every chat line that just goes in and says something stupid? Or are you the guy that goes in and takes time to help people out and give them uh, real responsible answers and you become the go-to guy in, in, in your area of expertise? Uh, that's the kind of digital presence that you're building up now and will uh, return to your benefit when you start to look for a job. So we'll talk about these things. None of it is anything that's immediate, but it's something that is a process. And if we start thinking about it now, then we have 30 months to maybe get our jackass pictures, you know, off the front of Facebook or, or something like that and start building the online you that you want to be out there that are for everyone to find. So uh, that's a little bit about what we're going to talk about the next three or four weeks. Uh, everybody needs to get a couple of tools sets put together. So first off, we don't require anyone to have any uh, software on your laptop other than a browser. As long as you can connect to the internet, you can do FSO. But you're going to need something to do your homework with. So um, we want you to use the online versions of Office. And to that uh, degree, Google Drive Docs and OneDrive are what we recommend to everyone. So we're asking everyone uh, if you've already signed up with Google, when you get an account with Google, they give you lots of things that you have access to. So they'll give you Gmail and an email account, 
We don't really care about that, but they'll give you a YouTube account so you can host videos. That's going to be incredibly important. Uh, <clears throat> and they give you access to what they call Google Drive tools. Google Drive tools is a suite of applications that live in the browser. And every time you go to your Google Drive, you can create a Google Doc, which is a word, uh, like a Word Doc, uh, a Google Spreadsheet, or some Google Slides. So we're going to do presentations with Google Slides. We're going to create documents with Google Docs. And there are a number of advantages to working with an online tool. One is that Google has an incredible online um, uh, maintenance rate. They never, their servers never go down. And from the moment you start an online doc and you type your first keystroke, it's all saved on Google's servers. One of the things we don't accept around here is the dog ate my homework. The dog can't eat your homework unless the dog is somewhere on the internet because you're going to do all your work online and you're not going to print anything out. We don't even really want you to give us files. When you use a Google Doc, you can actually share the document. So you don't even have to make a physical um, digital file and pass that along. So to that extent, we want everyone to look in the materials tab and the very first thing that you see there is called Google Collaborative Tools. And I've made us a Google document here and I've given everyone permission to share in it. So although it's my document, I created it, I opened up the permissions to everyone. Now, this isn't gonna work for all 90 of us, but everybody grab a square if you can and type your name and then type your favorite flavor of ice cream. And we'll just see how many people we can get here. Uh, this, this thing can usually handle at least 30 people before it crashes, typing simultaneously. Isn't that amazing? A single document that lives on a server, probably several servers all over the world, and all of you are in here and you have full editing capabilities. You can change what else for someone else wrote. Don't do that tonight, it's not nice. But um, as many people as we can get in here, uh, all you have to do is go to the Materials tab and click on the link that says Google Drive Collaborative Tools and uh, pick a cell. You can even have two people typing in the same cell. It doesn't really matter. But we all, you know, we, we, we've got 20 people here now, so you can see the power of this. We're going to work together in teams, and you guys are going to be able to do, use collaborative documents to write things together as a team. And all you need is a Google account. Sign up with Google. It's free. They give you Gmail. They give you a YouTube account, and they give you Google Drive tools. So uh, we want everyone to get a Google Drive tool account. And if you're a Microsoft guy and you love those applications, uh, we don't want you to feel left out because Microsoft is on board too. Microsoft has moved on from just being an Office suite on a CD-ROM, and they actually have a, a website as well. It's called uh, OneDrive. And so you can sign up with, with Microsoft and I'm going to put the link in the uh, chat box if anybody uh, needs it or wants it. Uh, instead of signing up with Google, you can sign up with Microsoft, and they will give you online space, and they will give you access to online versions of the actual Microsoft Office suite tools. You have actual Word and uh, Excel and, and PowerPoint and so forth, and you're still sharing documents. It works pretty much the same way, so you have the choice of using either Google or Microsoft OneDrive, but both are online. Every time you type something in an online document, it's saved on the servers. So if your computer crashes, I'm sorry about your computer, but you didn't lose your work, everything you're doing is saved on the server. If you find another computer and log in, everything that you typed up until the point that your computer crashed will all be there. So this is the modern way to work. We don't want to work on our drives in our, on our, our own drives or our own computers and then have them be subject to power failures. We want to work with online tools where everything is automatically backed up and automatically saved. So uh, if you don't know which you want to use, uh, you might try both. Uh, I will say that the versions of the software that Google has is simpler to use. They have fewer options. One of the things about Microsoft, they've been in business so long that they just keep adding to their software. So sometimes you'll be in, a, in an application and it'll have five or six toolbars and, and you just feel intimidated because there's so much choice. 
And that's a lot of power. If you know how to use it, please feel free to use it. But if you don't want all that power, Google is a simpler version. It still gives you everything you need. You can change fonts. You can change font sizes. You can bold and italic. You can set alignments. So, you know, uh, if I want to be big and bold, I can be big and bold. So we have a lot of power here. Uh, and this is the start, not a final decision that you're making. So uh, sign up for both or one and start using it. If you find one that you don't like and you might try switching to the other, but you need to be able to use a collaborative tool. So Google Docs and OneDrive are the choices. So um, let's talk about the assignments for the week a little bit. Uh, the first thing that you're going to have to deal with is the uh, 1.4 discussion. I'm hoping everybody got started today and maybe after signing up for your go-to, you started reading the article uh, in 1.2 by uh, Mark Prinsky, Digital Immigrants, Digital Natives. Uh, that's what we want everyone to read. It's an excellent um, way to begin. And Mark Prinsky basically posits the notion that uh, coming into using computers and being digital and, and working online is like going to a foreign country. And if you were born before the age of computers and you come to it late, you feel like a fish out of water. You feel like a stranger in a strange land and you always feel like a digital immigrant. However, if you grew up with technology, and I'm betting that most of you had Nintendo Game Boys when you were three or four years old and you've had game, game systems all your life and you feel like digital natives. And so uh, you may feel much more at ease with that material. Well, um, the discussion that we're doing in 1.4 leaves off from the Prinsky article. Everybody has to read the Prinsky article, think about it, and then I want you to react to it. And you're going to react to it in the 1.4 post. And the really interesting thing is, while when you read the Prinsky article, you'll think it's fresh, you'll think it's, you know, just from today. But he actually wrote it in 2001. That's over 15 years ago. So we're asking if people were dividing into digital immigrants and natives a decade and a half ago, what are people today? And so we want you to answer that. We want you to talk about who you are as your digital self. We want you to answer the question directly to Prinsky, who am I? Uh, how comfortable am I with technology? We want you to talk about the technology you grew up with, uh, what you're fluent in. You don't have to... Uh, talk about what you want to do in the future. We just want to know what kind of a digital actor you are today. And as part of that, we want you to create a name for yourself. We don't want anybody to say they're a digital native. Uh, you may be a digital native, but now it's a decade and a half later. We want you to come up with your own term for what you're doing, who you are. And to go along with that, we want everyone to create what we're calling a digital vision. The digital vision is a, an original piece of art that you're going to create this, this week to go with your post. Think of it like the illustration for an article. And you have an awful lot of choice. Um, we're going to give you a lot of things that you can work with, and you can also work with the tools that you already know. So uh, we don't want anybody to turn in just a single photograph or a selfie, but you can start with a selfie and begin to work it and manipulate it. So you have an awful lot of choice. You have digital drawing tools. You can make images. You can make drawings. You can make videos. You can make audio pieces. But we want you to create an original piece of art that helps to explain the article that you're writing, the, the post that you made. So don't work on the vision first. Figure out what your post about Prinsky is, and then think of the vision as the illustration for that article. This is a, something called bit strips. It allows you to make yourself a, a computer character, a cartoon character, put yourself in situations. Uh, here's a collage. Here, this is, called, this is a, um, uh, a, a, a tool called Poplet. So if you're a programmer guy and you're sort of uh, much more analytically minded, you can make an infographic about yourself. We have a lot of people making word clouds in which they take things that are important to them and use those terms to help define who they are. Uh, this is the kind of thing we like. We have um, a word cloud that was made on a computer, but then uh, they didn't. she didn't stop there. She took her little Hello Kitty doll and set it on her keyboard, and then she took a photograph. So we have three layers of reality here. We have the computer screen. 
we have the doll, and we have the photograph showing that in a context sitting on a keyboard. Uh, here's another infographic. This person is uh, creative, and they're, they feel like they're part digital native, part digital immigrant, and they're mapping it out. And uh, there are a number of ways to show who you are. It doesn't have to be photographic. This person used text. They gave themselves the term conflicted traveler. You're, you're going to be tempted to put the word digital in front of your name for yourself. It doesn't have to be. You, you can feel free to be digital ninja or, you know, digital acrobat. Or you could have any term you want. You can make up that term, but you have to explain it. This person was conflicted traveler, and she put the, her dark thoughts on the left and her light, fun thoughts on the right. So we can see that this is a kind of a, a two-brain thing here. Uh, more playing with type. Um, this person made a drawing. She talked about her third eye. Once you start looking at her third eye, you can't stop looking at it. Uh, here, This guy started with a selfie, but he's in graphic design, and he likes the artist Magritte and Apple, so he made a Magritte painting uh, or an homage to a Magritte painting uh, about himself out of his selfie. So uh, it's it's fun. It's art referential. It's um, uh, very much a hipster graphic artist thing. Uh, here's another bit strip fellow dr tripping along the moon. So you can see there are a lot of choices here. We want we don't want you to make something that's just like the person who posted before you. We want you to all be different. We want you to all be a snowflake. So uh, there's lots of choices. We see a lot of people using word uh, clouds. Um, that's an easy thing to do, but we would like you all to push past it. Even if you're using word clouds, maybe you can do other things with it. This person made a, a, a front of a, a phone. So we've got the different icons and we have the buttons at the bottom. Another drawing. I like this drawing because this person's using so much power. She's plugged into four outlets at the same time. Uh, another drawing, this person was digital divergent. So uh, this person is generators and he uses Photoshop. And if you know how to use Photoshop, feel free to use it. Uh, but, uh, you know, this level of skill to be able to blend, you know, 20 or 30 layers together, uh, you're not going to learn that on the first day. So if you don't know Photoshop, don't try to use it until you know how to use it. Uh, here's a fairly simple metaphor. This guy feels squeezed by the me media he creates. He took a selfie and... Uh, boxed himself in by the media that is uh, surrounding him. So you see an awful lot of choices here. Uh, what we really are looking for is an idea or, or a metaphor. Uh, here we see a hand holding a pencil going up against the computer screen. That's the kind of metaphorical image we're looking for. Uh, this guy's a photographer. And he's got his, his, old, uh, his old love and his new love. So uh, the two types of cameras are together. This guy's more of a performance artist. So we see a lot of choices here. Here's a gamer. We see the games he loves. He's kind of wearing a Boba Fett helmet. And uh, this guy manipulated his image so much, I'm not sure he's still there. So you have a lot of choice for what you can do. Uh, and if you're not sure what software you want to use, that's why we suggest you go to the lab. Your teacher is going to show you a lot of possibilities just like I did. And the last thing I want to talk about is the main assignment for the week. Uh, and it uses another thing that we're asking everyone to go get, which is Digo. Digo is online bookmarking software. It allows you to collect your bookmarks in an online space rather than in the uh, browser on your computer. Again, if your computer died, you'd lose all your bookmarks. But if you save your bookmarks to Digo, then you can uh, have access to them and you can share them for people all around the world. And that's what's really important here. So uh, in, the, in the main assignment for the week that's going to take, uh, you know, a little bit of your time here, it's called Exploring Digital Literacy. You may not have gotten this far, and I'm going to go through it very briefly. Your teacher will go through it in much more detail. But we have a number of words here that we want you to look up. When I say look up, don't think dictionary. I don't want people to think this is a boring assignment. This is a surf the web until your eyes are blue uh, assignment. Uh, so I want you to surf the places you normally surf. If you're an audio production guy, I want you to surf music sites. If you're a video game guy, I want you to surf video game sites. But we want you to find these terms in context. And when we do, we want you to bookmark them with Digo and send those bookmarks to your Digo account. And you're going to collect so many bookmarks. And from having read what these terms mean in context, you're then going to make your own definitions. So, you know, if, you're, if you care what Merriam-Webster has to say, 
fine for you, but that's a boring definition. We want you all to make your own definition based on the reading of material that you normally watch. Uh, and when you save your bookmarks with Digo, uh, we want you to add extra information. We want you to add tags and uh, highlights to them. And so I want to show you how to make uh, highlights. Now, most of you will be using the Chrome browser, which has a, a permanent extension. There's just a little icon that you can always get at. I'm in a uh, Safari browser. It's on a Mac. So if I go to Google here and uh, I type in one of the terms that I like, have to have to find, uh, <clears throat> and go to Google, I'll see that there is um, one billion two hundred and forty million hits for the word wiki. That's a little bit to go through. I'll bet I don't get through the first million and a half. Um, so also notice that probably the very first link for anything you look up in Google is going to be Wikipedia. Now, Wikipedia is a fine source, but what it is is secondary information. Somebody else did a research paper on wikis, and they wrote a paper about it. That's not going to tell you a lot. It's going to tell you what that person did. But I'll show you a really great way to use Wikipedia's resources. If, if I want to know about wikis, if I go to the Wikipedia entry on wikis, instead of reading what the Wikipedia, uh, actually, that's the main page. But if I, here's the Wikipedia entry on wikis. Instead of reading this write-up that someone did as a report, every single um, article in Wikipedia when they do a report like this, they put the research that they used at the bottom. So these are the direct information sources that they use. So uh, if you if you want to use Wikipedia, what I suggest is go to Wikipedia and steal the reference sources because this is the pure stuff. Um, but even so, that's still not that interesting because it's only talking about wikis. If you're a music guy, you should you should put in wiki and music. Or whatever you're interested in, uh, you're going to find articles, of, you know, the history of music wiki. Uh, that's going to be more interesting for you to read, and that'll tell you more about what you're going to know. And it doesn't have to be what you're studying. You know, there's a really terrific wiki on The Simpsons. So if I put in wiki in Simpsons, it'll takes me to the Simpsons wiki, and it has all the information. Uh, that's that's Wikipedia, but here's the Simpsons wiki. Everything about The Simpsons that was ever done or known is here. So, uh, you know, this is the way that you find things out. You just surf till your eyes are blue. And when I want to uh, bookmark something, let's go here and uh, let's say I want to bookmark this page. Uh, there's never anything but pictures here. Let's go back a little and find something else. All right. Uh, let's say I want to capture this page and I want to highlight this material. You would then go to your Chrome browser and bring up the uh, Digo extension. I don't know if you all have it in installed yet. I actually bring up my Digo extension by hitting this little button that says Digo. It, it brings this up. It allows me to uh, highlight material so I can create highlights. And then when I want to create a bookmark, it actually gives me uh, choices for tags that I can use. So I can put Simpsons in there. And if I want to add the tag DGL vocab, because that's the name of the assignment, here's a trick for adding multi word tags. You have to put it in a quote mark. So if I type in here, actually, why is that? This bookmark is locked. Anyway, what I wanted to show you is that uh, if you type single words in, they become tags. If you want a phrase as a, ta a tag, you need to put it between quotes. And again, your teacher will explain that to you. But you're going to build up a list of links. And from that list of links, you'll just send that to your uh, teacher, and we will look at it on the web page. Uh, again, a lot of people have trouble figuring out that we don't want to do things the old way. They'll, they'll want to print out the web page or they'll want to export the web page to a PDF. All you need to do is send us a link to your Digo file. Uh, here's my Digo library, and here's the uh, Simpsons link that I created, and here are my tags. And 
Uh, that's why I couldn't add to it. I had already bookmarked it. But you can see that I can add tags, and here, here are the, high, uh, the, the highlights that I created. So this is what your saved bookmarks will look like. And this is what the link to it looks like. It has this format here. Uh, it'll always be digo.com slash user slash your username that you picked. So all you need to do is send us to your Digo page, and we will grade your homework on the web. You don't have to print it out. Uh, we're not asking you to do busy work. We're asking you to do real life things, and that's what your homework is going to consist of. So uh, that's a very quick run through of this assignment. Uh, but again, your teachers are going to go through that in uh, more detail with you. Uh, another thing I want to mention, uh, assignments open up on Monday mornings, 12.01 a.m., and they will close at midnight on Sunday. And midnight on Sunday means Eastern time. In you know Florida, we're in, we're in Eastern time. If you're in the West Coast, then assignments will close at 9 p.m. for you. But it didn't mean you lost three hours. Assignments opened at 9, 9.01 a.m. or 9.01 p.m. for you uh, instead of midnight because of the, the time zone change. So on weekends, uh, when assignments are due, students want a little bit of extra help. So we run a helpline, and it's called dglhelp at aim.com, and you'll be able to find one of the teachers manning it on weekends. We run at 11 to 7 p.m. on Saturdays and 1 to 9 p.m. on Sundays. So uh, you should be able to get this um, address from your teacher's contact hours. And uh, it's also the query question for attendance tonight. So uh, the second link in the materials tab says web attendance link. And if I click on it, it loads a Google form. We love Google. And all you need to do is put your teacher's name. If you don't know your teacher's name yet, you will learn it through this week. But it's whoever wrote you the welcoming letter. Uh, that you got in your messaging when you first logged on uh, uh, this morning. And there's always a query question for the attendance. And this week's query question is, what is the username for DGL help that line, uh, the, D the DGL help line? And you'll notice that I've actually written it below the link in the materials tab. It's DGL help at aim.com. So it's pretty easy to, to remember. DGL help at aim.com is the query question for attendance. And that brings us to attendance. Everyone should log in to this link and do their attendance, and then you're free to go. Uh, so that's it for the night. I'm going to stay and answer questions as long as there are questions. I see several hands raised. I don't know if they were raised accidentally. I'm going to lower all the hands, and anybody who has a question, raise your hand, or you can type your question in the chat box, and I'll stay here and answer questions as long as people have questions. So the first person I want to call on is Justin... Uh, Alminas. Hi, Justin. Are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Yeah, I'm here. Hi, Justin. How you doing? I'm good. And yourself? I'm fine. What's your question? Uh, uh, actually, it was uh, about when you were on the uh, Google Doc and everybody was typing their favorite ice cream. Yes. Um, I I, I couldn't find how to get into that document. Okay, did you see so, the web attendance link? Is going to help me how to do that? Uh, yes. The, um, uh, I... on, this, on this control panel here, there's a panel that says materials. It might be, you know, closed up and you have to click on the little arrow to open it up. But if you find the panel okay. that says materials. Oh, okay. If you open it up, you'll see two links. One says Google Collaborative Tools. If you click on that, it's going to take you directly to that page. And, yep. and, and by clicking on it, you have permission to write anywhere you want. And the second link there is the attendance link. So the materials tab is where we put stuff permanently that we want people to have access to. All right, it, awesome. It may be closed, uh, and all you need to do is click the little arrow, and it'll open up. Yeah, okay. it was closed. Uh, thanks, Justin. Thanks. Uh, next person, Donnie Elder. Eller. Sorry. Hi, Donnie. Are you there? Yeah, I'm here. How are you doing? I didn't realize that my hand was up. I oh, I didn't have problem. a question. You do have a question? No, I didn't. I didn't. Okay, no problem. Um, Melissa Wanjik. 
I apologize if I mangled your name. Is that W of E? No. Wojcik or is it Wojcik? No, you no, you said it perfectly. That's that's a shock for people. <laughs> oh, I hate to mangle people's um, names, and I do it all the time. You know, it's one of them last names I given up years ago on. So, <laughs> um, my question was, I signed on a little, a few minutes late, and at the end, you just had some kind of survey. What we have to take. Where do I find that? Uh, again, uh, if you click on the attendance link. Um, where's the attendance? It's link? in the materials tab. I was just talking about how you got into the 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 ice cream page. That's uh, yeah. Uh, in the materials tab. The, the, oh, okay. And and the one I below I, you know, is the web yeah. attendance, and that's how we know who showed up. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. Sure. Nicholas White. Hey, Nicholas. Yeah. Um. So the last the last woman just answered my question, so that did it for me. I just forgot to put my hand back down. Okay, no problem. Thanks. No, thank you. Uh, Pierre Gilson. Hello. Hi. Got a question? Hello. Hi. Yes, I do. Well, I was referring to the projects that you showed earlier about the um, digital natives and the digital um, immigrants. Yes. So I was checking about because I wanted to I want to know can we do a collage and also incorporate poetry with it? Absolutely. Now the rules are you can't use other people's stuff. Now we're a little bit leaning uh, on that. Yeah. Like if you want to use uh, icons and and, and the yeah. covers of video games that are important to you, you know you can use stuff That's in the world, but you can't use someone else's artwork. You can't use someone else's yes. thing, that kind of thing. But if yeah, you I was just thinking pretty multimedia. I I really would love to see that. Yes, yes. I'll just like pretty much incorporate like just words. I'll just look up and just incorporate them in the poetry in the collage and have it rhyme a rhyme scheme for it. Sure. And uh, what I didn't go through, and your teacher will definitely go through for you, um, is that in this discussion box. Um, let me uh, go in here real quick. Um, you can add media. So in the same way that I have a picture here, when I start to type, if we click on this last button here that's called media. You have something where you can drag audio, you can drag video, or you can drag pictures onto it, or link out to it. So if you make an audio piece of your spoken uh, words or something, you can just yes. load it in as a piece of audio. Okay, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Sure. Uh, Rod Petty. Hello? Hi, Rod. Hey, how you doing? Uh, mine also was uh, to the, the digital natives. So we could use uh, mobile apps such as uh, pick collages, things of that nature for the project also, right? Absolutely. Now what you're going to do is you're going to link it into the discussion. So if you use um, a phone app, you need to be able to send that image to the, uh, the web page, the FSO assignment page. As long as you can do that, you can use any okay. software that you like. All right. Thank you. Sure. Um, Jeremy Straw. Strong? Yeah, Strong. Okay. Yeah. How you doing? Um, yeah, I had, I'm pretty good. Just pretty good? I think, aren't you great? Yeah, I have actually two questions. Sure. Um, one was I caught the very end of uh, how we find out how you find out who signed in for tonight. Um, it's a web form. If you go to the materials tab, um, there's a link that says web attendance link. The materials mm -hmm. tab is one of the blue windows on the control panel. It says materials. Okay. And you'll see something that says web yeah. attendance link. And your okay. question okay, was? It. The other question, um, for the collage thing that we're doing, um, can I use something called GIMP? Oh, sure. Uh, that's, that's like open source Photoshop? 
Yeah. Sure. Okay, because I didn't know if we could use that or... We encourage people that, to use what we call Web 2.0 tools, which are online software. But if you have desktop software that you're proficient with, you know, uh, certainly you're free to use that. Okay, what would be a, an example of, like, uh, the web software? I didn't catch that either. Well, um, we were we were showing a lot of word cloud stuff, and, and, and uh, I showed bit strips and whatnot. But there's actually um, online yeah. Photoshop type tools as well. Um, Autodesk, I think, has okay. one uh, that you can use as a web page. Yeah, Autodesk. Um, really? Okay. Uh, to, Photo uh, FX or something like that. Um, and again, it's fairly sophisticated. Okay. You have to um, know how to use uh, that kind of software already. But again, you could use it in a web browser. Yeah. Uh, but. It, if you already have uh, software on your machine that you're proficient with, we're not asking you to learn a brand new program just to do uh, a submission for Wednesday. So work okay. with what you're familiar with. Gotcha. Um, I'm familiar with numerous things. Like um, I've used Blender, I've used Autodesk, I've used GIMP, I've used uh, Unreal Engine. I mean, I've used numerous things. Okay, well, uh, you know, you have to just work with what you want to use. So, uh, and this again, we're not looking for you to, you don't have to show off, you don't have to kill yourself. We want you to make a simple metaphoric idea. The production is not the most important part, it's the idea that's the important part. And the idea should relate to okay. what you've written in your post. Okay. All right. Thanks. Sounds good. Um, All righty, uh, Thomas Griffin. Hello, how are you? Hi, Thomas. Hello. Do you have a question? Can you hear me? I hear you fine. Yes. Um, I, my question was for. Okay, my question was. All right, you just broke up. Try it again. Okay. I'm sorry, I didn't hear it. Could you ask your question uh, again? pertaining to the digital identity? Sure. And my question is where will we post it where it's when it is finished? I wanted to get the right spot. Okay. Um, the assignment is considered 1.4. So if you go to the 1.4 discussion bar board in your section, mm -hmm then uh, you, you would just make a post. So you would type your post, All right. and when you have an image to put in, there's the final button on the toolbar above the, the uh, text input line. It's called the media button, and that allows you to link in images or video. So you're, we want you to write your post and put your image together in this, you know, the same post if you can. Okay, because I just wanted to be sure that and I got the right. And this is the right 1.4 assignment page. Does that make sense? Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Um, Alrighty, I'm going to call on uh, Travis Loveland. Hello. Hi, Travis. Can you hear me? I hear you fine. Hey, um, I'm having a question. Okay, cool. Um, I have a question about the uh, due date. I see that the um, first assignment where you do the um, collage or whatever you want to do is due Wednesday. When is the next assignment due? It doesn't say it, or does okay. it say it until you complete it? All assignments open on a Monday, you know, and they close on a Sunday. So technically, this assignment closes on Sunday. But what we want everyone to do is to get their first post in by Wednesday because this on the discussion board, you not only have a responsibility to make your post, but you have a responsibility to respond to your classmates. And if we let everyone wait till Sunday night to make their first post, no one would have anything to respond to. So we set an artificial deadline of Wednesday night, end of day, and that's just soft. It's not going to time out on you or anything like that. 
but we want everyone to get their first post in by the end of day on Wednesday and then come back on Thursday, Friday, Saturday and read everybody else's posts and respond to them. So the full assignment is you make your post and then you have to respond to other people and it'll affect your grade if you don't respond to other people. So we needed everyone to be able to get their posts in by Wednesday if they can. And if you're a little bit late, sometimes people get added to the classes late and whatnot, but you know, we can let that slip to Thursday or so, but you need to get your post up in order to give other people time to read it and respond to it. That's all I got. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I'm glad you brought that up because I meant to mention it. Uh, Kristen Watts. Here. Hi, Kristen. Hello. Yeah. Hi. How are you doing? Good. How about you? Um, I'm doing really good. Excellent. Well, my question was, um, I do uh, 3D computer animation, and I want to know if I can incorporate my some of my original um, renders in my picture collage. Um, yes. What we ask is that you make something for this assignment. You can quote okay. all the work, which means that if you have a model or you already have something in process and you do a rendering for this assignment, and you maybe add something to it so that you know it's relevant to the, the discussion rather than just, oh, I have a dog that I made and here it is. Um, you can use old work, but you need to put it in an envelope. You need to re-quote it. You need to make something uh, okay. this week, even though you're using older elements. Okay, so I can make something new to go with this. Yes, and it, and it could be models that you've already made or scenes that you've already set up. But as long as you're creating the the output, the render for this particular assignment, instead of you know it's something that you'd already done six months ago and you didn't change it, uh, it's fine. Okay, cool. Sure. Thanks. Uh, Clara Bartolo. Hi. Hello. Actually, you spell you spell my last name wrong. It's Bortoloto. I'm sorry. I think you spelled it though because it came from your registration. Oh gosh. All right then. So my question is, I didn't actually understand uh, what about the main sign is the 1.5. What do I have to do for the main sign? Okay. Um, so. The, f the first part is just setting up Digo so you're, and learning how to use it so you're comfortable with it. And then we have a list of 20 terms here. This is, this is the instruction for 1.5. And so we want you to take each one of these terms and we want you to find it used in context somewhere out on the web. So you're going to bookmark websites that use this term. Now the cheap way to do that is to go straight to a dictionary and look up the term. But that's not what we're asking you to do. We're asking you to look uh, at interesting stuff to get lost in surfing. You know, it should take many hours because you're just going to be, you know, going down the rabbit hole looking at web page after web page. But you're you're trying to find these terms used in context, and when you find good examples of it, you will bookmark it to Digo. And the way that you bookmark with Digo, I don't know if you've got Digo set up yet, but you, you install an extension into your browser which allows you to create bookmarks. And the bookmarks look like this. This is my Digo library, so you can see bookmarks that I've created. And we want you to add tags to the bookmarks that you make so that the term you're looking up is included and the, and the, and the name of the assignment, DGL vocab, is included. And we want you to highlight stuff so we'll know why you were looking at that web page, etc. And we want you to find multiple uh, sources for each one of these terms. So instead of just finding the, the, the term once, we want you to find two or three or more uh, um, bookmarks or web pages that use these terms in context so that you're building a set of resources. And we want you to actually read those pages. And having read them, you should then be able to make your own personal definition of each term. So this assignment is in two parts. First is the surfing, and you're going to create 30 or 40 or 60 bookmarks on Digo with these terms in context. And then you're going to go to a, a text file 
you could use Google Docs if you like, and you're going to define each term as a personal definition, meaning you're not cutting and pasting from some web page. You're figuring, you're making the the definition that you would write yourself if you were explaining it to your brother or your sister or something like this, assuming that you already know like what encryption means. If if, if you're if someone asks you what is encryption, what would you say? You probably wouldn't say it like Webster would. You'd probably say it in your own words. And that's what we're looking for you to put in that text file. All 20 terms defined with, uh, you know, the language that you would use to define it, your personal definitions. And that text file you right. would then upload to your homework or to the web page. Okay. Thank you very much. Sure. Um... Casey Campbell. Hey, how's it going? Good. All right, I had uh, two questions, if you don't mind. Uh, the first is with the, uh, you said we have to comment on our uh, other classmates' uh, product, uh, projects. Sorry. Yes. Uh, now, where am I going to do so? All right, it's a discussion board, 1.4 is a discussion board. If we look at the activities, um, they, they have numbers on them. And so 1.1 is where you sign up for these set live sessions. 1.2 is where you read the Prinsky article. 1.3 is where you, you sign up and get a Digo account and install it in your browser. 1.4 is where you're going to have a discussion board. And in this discussion board, you will post your post and you will respond to other people's posts. So I've made this post and I have this image up here and you could reply to it. So when other people get all their own first posts in, we want you to come back and read what other people wrote and you have a responsibility to respond to at least two other people. Uh, I would prefer if you respond to three or four other people. That's a great way to get to know who your classmates are. So the responding is something that happens after everyone gets their initial posts in. You can't respond until someone has a post. And that's what may be confusing for you because probably at this point, no student has posted. But I can also tell you the very first student who posts in each discussion gets the most response and usually the most praise. So if you want to be the first guy in, you will probably get the best feedback. Okay. I was just under the impression that uh, that was between the uh, teacher and the student there at the bottom for those posts. Well, here, here's a... Um, you need to give, get used to this terminology. When I say post, that's public for everybody. When I come down here, you're going to see a comment section. Um, when it says comment, that's between you and your teacher. But this is a okay. discussion board, so the post is for everybody. Comments are between you and your teacher. Okay, and then uh, my other question was about Digo. Uh, I see we are limited. You want us to uh, bookmark and highlight. Uh, certain things, especially for those phrases, I see we are limited on uh, how many things we can highlight. Well, the thing about Digo is um, it's a free service, and they're probably going to try to upsell you. See how it says Go Premium? We don't want anybody to have to pay money. Yeah. So uh, the deal is with the free service, I think you get so many highlights overall. And it's probably more than you'll use for our assignment, it's like 500 or whatever. But really, you can probably only put two or three highlights per page in. So one good highlight or two highlights per page is really all we're asking for. And if, if you wanted to put six highlights on a single web page, they may say that's a premium feature. And if okay, they ask I just wasn't money, sure how often we'd be using this service. What? I just wasn't sure how often we would be using this service uh, along this course. Well, it's a study aid. Uh, we, we're having this assignment. You uh, you probably use it in a couple of other assignments you have with us. And if it becomes something useful to you, you'll probably want to use it through school. Uh, and, you know, it's uh, it's entirely possible to use it forever for free without paying them any money. So don't worry about that. All right. Thank you, sir. Sure. Uh, I'm going to lower all the hands, and if anybody else has a question, just raise your hand. Or you can type it in chat if you're having trouble with uh, your microphone. Okay, Keith Rowe. Hi, Keith, are you there? 
You might need to unmute yourself. Keith, I've unmuted you, but you'll have to unmute yourself and to make mic live. There you go. Hi, Keith. Uh, all right, well, it doesn't look like we're going to get anywhere. Uh, I see Angel Toro's hand went up. Angel, was that automatic or did you actually have a question? I do have a question, actually, please. Sure. Um, I cannot find how to get to the document that has the vocabulary on it that you had a slide of earlier. Uh huh. That's assignment 1.5. So oh, okay. I didn't look if, if you go to 1.5, you'll see that it's a, a downloadable PDF. Okay. Um, also, the lab sessions for DGL, I've been trying to, I've clicked on that multiple times. One time it just brought me to log into Citrix. Now it's giving me some lab session options, but they're at the same time and only twice a week. Like, are those going to be recorded so we can look at them afterward? Yes. I mean, the, the problem that we always have whenever we set something live is that somebody can't make it. So if you're not able to attend, we understand you won't get penalized. But any lab that's done is recorded and the recording is posted. So uh, I try to have my, my recordings up like, a couple of hours after the, the session's over. So, uh, w you know, we're pretty good around, about turnaround and you'll be able to watch the video. So will I just access them through that sign up for a lab link? Uh, each teacher tends to do it differently. I try to put it back where the link was. Some people put it in the community discussion board, but your teacher, or, or sometimes they'll put it out in a message so you'll get an announcement with it in it. Each teacher does it slightly differently, but uh, you should be looking for that. I would actually write your teacher a message just up here saying, how can I view the the recordings of the labs? And she'll, he, she will tell you directly. Okay, great. Thank you. All right. And I have a few more hands up here. Taylor Hale. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, I hear you well. All right. Um since you're on the subject of uh, 1.5, uh, where you uh, drag and drop the items, I put I made a video on Animoto, and then also wrote a full short page, like the assignment asked, right? You made you a video to, uh, for 1.5 or 1.4? Uh, the 1.5, where uh, it says uh, exploring digital literacy, and then the FAQ and the instructions. I just didn't know if you wanted us the the video or picture, whatever you asked us to do. I think at 1.4, I think. I didn't know if that's where you wanted us to upload it or not. No. See, the, the picture or the digital vision is for 1.4, which is the discussion board. And we want you to link it into the discussion board. Uh, okay. 5 is the vocabulary thing. And all you're going to upload here on the drag and drop is the text file with your uh, definitions. But if I go okay. to uh, 1.4 here, to the discussion board, I will. Uh, you, you'll see at the top in the discussion board you can make posts, and these are posts that everybody can see. Uh, on the toolbar, you can type anything you want. When you want to put your image or your, your, your vision in, you click on this last button in the toolbar. It says Media, and when you do that, you're going to get a pop-up. And you can actually okay. drag video straight okay. onto this as long as it's under 300 megabytes and is an MPEG-4. It won't accept AVI or WMV, but MPEG-4 video is fine, and uh, WAVE or MP3 audio is fine. So you can just drag stuff straight into there, or you can host things. We uh, You can link out to YouTube, Video, uh, or Vimeo, Viddler, Spotify, SoundCloud, Google Drive, GoToTraining, Linda, TED Talks, and other hosted files. So if you want okay. to create something and put it on... Um, uh, YouTube, you can link back into it with the URL, and that'll go directly right, yeah, into yeah, the box. Yeah, I just made a short video and then uh, wrote a little paper uh, kind of discussing the... Um, so if, if the video is under 300 megabytes, and it probably is, you can just drag it on there and we'll host it on the FSO platform. Okay, cool. Thanks. Sure. 
Okay, one more question. Uh, Venezia Gonzalez. And I probably mangled that one. I apologize. <laughs> it's actually pronounced Venezia, but not bad. Okay. Uh, my actual, my only question are regarding the Digo account was when we set it up, are we using uh, our most used email address or are we linking it to our full sale email address? As it, you said that it was... It's the one that works for you. It doesn't have to be your school email. I mean, uh, if, if, if you have another email account that is more convenient, then it's fine. Uh, as long as... Uh, you know, basically, really, the only email you're going to get is the initial click here to verify your address, and after that, you know, it doesn't matter. So uh, it, it, they just need it to set up the account. All right, that was my only question. Thank you. Sure. Okay, I think that's all the questions. This is Keith Rowe. I can't get my uh, the Digo browser uh, on my Safari window. Um, if you're on a Mac and you have Safari, uh, what happens with the Digo uh, thing is it installs a web JavaScript that you invoke, and it just comes up when you want it. And some people have it on their toolbar, and I just put it in a window. But uh, that is something that you will install from the uh, Digo website. If you go to the front of the Digo website and uh, – say get Digo now uh, actually I don't know uh, I know that the link is digo.com tools you have a place where you can um, I'm gonna drop this in the chat box uh, on this link you can install extensions or JavaScript files so if you're on a, a Safari this Digo lit is what they're asking you to install and and you can, it's as easy as grabbing the link and dragging it to your toolbar. See how I just installed it? That link will now work for me. So you can actually drag it on a, on a, on a Safari browser. That's an easy thing to do. Okay. Uh, anybody else have a question, raise your hand or type in chat, or I'm going to let you guys go. We've been here a while. So, again, welcome to everybody, and we're glad you're here, and we'll see you next week. Bye-bye.